Um, thank you everyone for welcoming me at, into your homes today. It's a fantastic conference. I'm really looking forward to speaking and, and to speak with the panelists as well today. Um, a little bit about ISO 37000. Um, ISO 37000 is not the 37,000th standard to be published by um, ISO, the International Standards Organization. It's just a number that they came up with, but we think it's quite a nice number. It's for the governance of organizations and it's a guidance standard. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It was published earlier this year on the 14th of September. So just a little bit about the International Organization for Standardization itself. It really was established after the Second World War by, and it reports into the United Nations Economic and Social Council. That's quite important because this standard specifically, its primary purpose is to facilitate international trade. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about how the standard, an international standard, works with national standards and um, codes and regulations around corporate governance. Um, the participation is about by national standards bodies, um, and the South African Bureau of Standards is one such body, and I chair the committee then that reports into this um, the ISO work around this particular standard. Um, most systems and um, most standards are management system standards. So uh, we think about um, quality management as a, uh, you know, the ISO 9001 or security management systems, information security and in ISO 27000. And so all of these are really management system standards. So it's just really difficult to try and get people to understand that this standard is not a management standard, but it has to be for governing bodies. It have, has to be for board levels. So we couldn't find another word in ISO. They have standards, they have technical reports, they have technical specifications, but they have nothing that says a code or a report. So although it's called a standard, we like to call it a guidance standard. It's, so it's guidance for governing bodies. I headed up the environmental scan work, which started in um, May 2017, and what we did was we looked at all the standards across the world, um, the regulations, the international, multinational standards, such as the OECD, um, even that is not entirely international, that's really, um, we've got the South American or the, the Latin American um, codes um, as part of the, uh, the OECD, we looked at oh, the whole world um, and all the stock exchange requirements as well. Um, we also looked at academic materials as well as um, academic publications and other publications, so case studies, for example, from the, um, the Tokyo uh, Stock Exchange. We had participation by 77 countries across the world and we had 83 international liaison organizations. So these are organizations that have the ability internally to consider standards and have their own internal debates with their, with their stakeholders and then come back with a collective answer. So for example, the International Corporate Governance Network, um, which is a network on corporate governance specifically for investors, has got a specific focus and um, they have an ability to look at the standard and come back with an answer. So they participated. Of course, we had the OECD, the IFC, we had the International Federation of Accountants and uh, the Global Network of Directors Institute, 83 of them. Um, we achieved, which is actually surprisingly um, not common, 100% approval on an international consensus basis. So every single country, um, we had approval in terms of the standard as it was um, published. So the standard, um, it's called Gardens for the government, it's guidance on the governance of organizations. Now we didn't call it corporate governance because the term corporate has connotations and those connotations are for large, large organizations. And this standard really is for all sizes and all types of organizations, no matter where they are located in the world. So it's really the governance and specifically of an organization. It doesn't cover um, political governance, for example, or state governance. Governance. It does um, address um, matters such as the governance of state-owned entities, but then, of course, other considerations need to be taken into account because you've got um, a, a purpose and you've got a, a um, you know the commercial viability of an organisation. So it is 
written for the governance of organizations, but all kinds of organizations. It is a guidance standard and it's principled based. So this is different from some um, regulations which are compliance requirements or uh, for example, Sarbanes-Oxley in the United States, um, that is legislation and it's more rules-based, um, comply or else. Whereas this is a principled-based um, standard or a code and it's the principles um, are written in using the terminology should instead of shall. You, um, this is what should be done. Um, it is definitely governance. It's not management. So we have a, a, a confusion where in some jurisdictions we have um, the dual board system where we have a, um, a governing body as a supervisory board and then a management board layer. And other, other um, in jurisdictions or countries have a unitary board system where we have the non-executive directors and executive directors in one board. So um, the point that the standard makes is that this is about a governance system or governance of the organization. And although we have these different types of directors or members of governing bodies, we do need to be careful to not slip into management. And we go into, in the standard, a little bit about the difference between governance and management. But just a reminder, this is to facilitate international trade. This is not, uh, the purpose of this is not around specific subject, other subject areas, um, specifically for investors, as an example, or specifically for um, a, a particular jurisdiction. This is really so that we can make sure that all organizations, it provides an international benchmark across all countries around what good governance looks like. So, it's beyond, they say, beyond corporate governance because it is for all sizes and types of organizations. It also considers um, what we consider is factors, future proofing the standard is factors that will come into play in the 21st century. So we did in our environmental scan, look at all the previous guidance, um, of course, uh, Professor Garrett's work, uh, Professor Tricker's work, uh, Professor King's work, uh, Peter Day's work out of, um, Canada, we looked at all of that context, but we also needed to make sure that we were future proofed and we had a look at what was required for 21st century organizations. So we had a very interesting conversations. So, for example, um, we had one delegation talking about um, the uh, what about artificial intelligence? Surely an AI bot is going to be less, um, less biased than a human person on a governing body level. So we had interesting discussions like that. And in fact, we landed on the term that um, governance is a human-based system just because of that, um, that discussion. So just a little bit about why we need to get into governance. And that's really around the um, market recognition that, governance, that the governance of an organization is really important. And you see this Ocean Tomo study that, that was done, and it's done pretty much every year, but you can see over time how moving into this 21st century, we have more and more reliance on that intangible assets or those assets that aren't reported on um, a balance sheet or an income statement or in your annual financial reports. So um, this consideration of these intangible assets is something that we needed to take into consideration that governance was actually being considered when investments were being made. Then we also needed to take into consideration the concept of uh, ESG. So if you're an institutional investor or you're uh, investing in your pension fund or you any, any of those kinds of organizations, you would have heard this term by now, ESG. In fact, COP26, it was mentioned a lot. Environment, social and governance. Now, this is a, a diagram that I use to explain it a little bit, is that if we consider governance as being the organization, um, then the consideration of the other factors of the environment and society is really this concept of double materiality. Um, and that, that's a phrase that was coined in the, e, um, in the EU um, and has been used now quite extensively, is this concept that the organization has an impact on the bottom layer, on, on society and the environment. 
And this was considered in the report from the Brundtland Commission, for example, and is considered in lots of detail in the Global Reporting Initiative standard, the standards, the GRI standards. We also needed to consider the fact, and that this is the emerging um, body of knowledge, is around the impact of the environment and society on the organization as well. So, hmm. Have I done that the other way around? I've did it done it the wrong way around. So the impact on of the organization on society and the environment is the GRI and the impact of environment and society on the organization is that growing body of knowledge. So that's the um, SASB standards, for example, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, and you might have seen that recently SASB is now merged into the IFRS Foundation. So very much accounting for the impact that that context, the organizational context has on the organization. So we had to consider these things when, um, when developing the standard because this is the future and we couldn't develop a standard that was only looking in the past. We needed to look into the future. So the structure of the standard, it starts off with an introduction and it provides a scope and it provides terms and definitions. Now, that's the standard is, is an, as an ISO standard, you, you know that most, stand, most ISO standards are paid for. And it's that payment that really funds the work of ISO being a part of the UN. So the free part that you can see when you access the standard online is the introduction, the scope and the terms and definitions. And the basics are available. We made very sure that the basics are available in that free to access. Then in the nuts and bolts of the standard, we have three main concepts. The first is that we need to establish the right conditions for good governance. And those conditions talk about the conditions in the organization and the conditions in the governing body itself. Then we have the governance principles and we also provide key aspects of practice, recognizing that every organization is different. So we're not prescriptive around the practices. We, we're just providing key aspects and guidance. And then importantly, we want to do all of this so that the organization itself achieves key governance outcomes. So those are the impacts that the organization will have. And that's around the three key um, areas. I'll, I'll explain it in the, in the model, but we wanted an end result. So why are you doing this? And what is the result going to be? What is the impact? of good governance. So just going through those clauses, clause four establishes these conditions for good governance. And when it talks about integrated governance, what it's really doing is it's talking about the conditions in throughout the organization um, that support good governance. And those are, are things like effective delegation, so making sure that the decisions made by the governing body um, and the responsibilities and accountabilities are effectively, or the responsibilities are effectively delegated throughout the organization. So we get that effective delegation framework. Then we talk about the difference between governance and management. And importantly, when a single person holds both their uh, responsibilities for governance as well as, as management, that they need to be clear in terms of when they're governing and when they're managing, because they will have different scopes, they'll have different authorities, and they'll have different perceptions from whoever they're speaking to. So if a, if a board member, um, an executive board member comes up to a staff member and instructs them to do something, are they talking on behalf of the board or are they talking as their manager or as part of the executive function? Is it a management um, instruction or is this a governance instruction? And then talking about sustainability, which is extremely important. We see that ESG sustainability is a key part of all governance, and it needs to be a key part in the governance of organizations in the 21st century. So considering the Brundtland report, the double materiality, that consideration of sustainability when governing. And finally, um, very much the emphasis on stakeholder inclusivity. So moving away from the primacy of the shareholder as being the only stakeholder to be considered to more in a stake, stakeholder inclusive approach. So those are key um, conditions in the organization, the attitude, the culture in the organization that 
are supportive of good governance at a governing body level. And then the governing body itself, um, the composition and structure, use making sure we've got effective um, committee structures. Um, you have uh, effective um, participation in the governing body, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, inclusivity, but also unity in, in decision-making, and then making sure that the, the governing body is suitably skilled to do its job, as is appropriate for the organization. Then the governing body, um, the governance model itself. This governance model is uh, free to access. It's in the uh, introduction. So you will see this, govern this, this governance model. In the center of the governance model is the purpose of the organization. Now, the purpose is twofold. It's the only principle, principle that actually has two parts. And the purpose goes hand in hand with the organizational values. So purpose and organizational values go together as a primary governance principle. So the purpose and values guide all the governance activities. So they're called the primary principle. It's called the primary principle. Then another layer on this model is that these core governance activities, these are called enabling governance principles. And these, those who have um, been practiced, well-practiced in the academics of governance can see that this is the um, Professor King, Professor Garrett, Professor Tricker models. He has the outside and inside and um, strategy, policy, oversight, disclosure, or you know, policy, strategy. So it all comes together in these foundational governance principles. I'll talk a little bit more about value generation because that's a new one. But strategy, strategy talks to policy, Oversight talks to uh, oversight and assurance and accountability talks to effective disclosure, really, and, and demonstrating accountability. Then when governing, we, as in the 21st century, we need more than just our foundational activities. We need these, what we call enabling governance principles, um, stakeholder engagement, ethical and effective leadership, making sure that we have effective or we have suitable data for our decision making, that it has integrity, um, that we are uh, governing risk effectively, whether that is actually managing our own risk as a governing body or making sure that risk is managed appropriately in our organizations. And then the two sustainability factors, making sure that we're demonstrating true social responsibility and that we are, and this is, I've just used the long-term viability, it's called viability and performance over time, is that we take this long-term perspective, and that's, these are the two key aspects around sustainability. The standard also says that you can't consider just the primary governance principle or just the foundational principles or just the enabling principles, they have to be done together. This is a collective, there's no sequential process, this is a collective applying these principles while you're governing. It needs to be done concurrently is the term it uses. So collectively, all of these, if they're done properly and appropriately for the organization concerned, the organization should achieve these governance outcomes. And they, those are demonstrating responsible stewardship of its own and the world's resources, um, effective performance, so meeting its targets, delivering as it's as it is said it's going to deliver, and then ethical behavior, behaving in a, in accordance to beyond compliance requirements, but behaving ethically, so integrity to a fault. Um, those are the three governance outcomes that we want to achieve, and I, I often use the the concept of sending your children to school. Um, you don't send your children to school just to pass their exams. You don't say, dear Johnny, bye, have a nice day at school, pass your exams. You say, go and, go and do your best. I, all I'm asking for you is for you to do your best. And that's what we're asking of organizations. That's what this governance, this model is all about. It's not about just doing the minimum compliance requirements. This is about organizations doing their best. And that's what we as stakeholders want our organizations to do. 
So I mentioned, I just want to stop on this value generation side because this value generation um, principle goes into a little bit more detail. Um, it's the only principle that provides a little bit of practice guidance. And that's because this concept of uh, value creation, preservation and erosion as the integrated reporting um, council talks it or the value reporting foundation, or now the IFRS foundation <laughs> calls it, is this value creation or IFR, that SASB calls it enterprise value creation. So we felt it was necessary. Um, we were dealing a lot with um, IFAC, CIMA, CGMA on this, this concept of value creation at the time. And we felt that this is an incredibly important um, aspect in the 21st century, is how organizations generate value. And the fact that um, organizations have been generating value using societies and the environment's free resources for too long, in fact, to the point where we are an overshoot now. So the concept of sustainability very much built into value generation as well. And the guidance is in terms of defining what is, is required. So defining your objectives, your value generation objectives, and that has to be done in consultation and engagement with relevant stakeholders. In fact, considering all stakeholders um, needs and expectations. Then creating that value, um, and then through strategies, designing your, your strategies, et cetera, um, and then delivering on that value. So then implementing your plans, of course, the governing body is going to be overseeing the organization doing that. And then finally, making sure that the organization is sustainable in its context, in its social and environmental context. So withholding um, dividends, for example, and not paying out dividends, um, withholding it to make sure that the organization is sustainable. We can think about examples um, like um, the Norwegian pension funds or the oil funds. Um, they, they're having to transition away from coal, away from carbon-based fuels. The whole world depends on them to do that. We're all watching them. They have to do it. And we need to do it. And we need to support them to do it. So how do we support them to do it? Well, we accept when they don't pay out dividends to their shareholders because they're using that money to be able to invest in renewable energy or alternative sources of energy. So we need to be cognizant of the ability to generate value in a sustainable way, um, both for the organization as well as for the context within which the organization is operating, which of course is um, the society, economy and the environment, right? Um, so that sustain is really important. So I thought, let me just draw this out a little bit um, and perhaps we can have a discussion around this in the panel. So just a final stop, whistle stop, um, working with national codes and standards. Essentially, ISO 37000 is intended to act as a conceptual framework. So I think in South Africa, for example, we have the King 4 report. And in King 4, the first three principles are on ethics. And in fact, there's a whole nother principle that talks about remuneration. And those are particularly important national imperatives. You may have seen on the news, um, all the corruption and allegations, et cetera, et cetera. It was really important for us to have three principles on ethics. In 37,000, ethics is entrenched in all the principles, but specifically under the leadership principle on ethical and effective leadership. Whereas that's the only principle we have on it in 37,000. And that's just an indicator of the national imperatives being um, expanded on within this conceptual framework. So we hope in, in ISO is that the next version of King, the King 5 report, would then be using 37,000 as the basis and again, expand on national imperatives. And we see that um, as a country start adopting ISO 37,000. Out of the 77 countries, I'm not sure exactly how many, but um, just in terms of the working group, we know that at least 12 to 13 countries now have adopted, um, this as a national standard. So the certification, the certification, this is not a certifiable standard. You can't say tick, 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 I'm, I'm certified now as an organization. This is a guidance standard. It provides guidance. You can't be certified on this standard, but you can have a certification of your understanding, whether that's through an international, um, it's a, um, it's a course, it's um, registered with your qualifications authority, et cetera. An individual can be certified in understanding. Um, in knowing this work. 
um, for example, at the Good Governance Academy, we use an organization called APMG International to, um, that's part of a certification body, and we have endorsed certifications um, on this training. We also look at the trainer. So we don't only look at the program of work and making sure that that is examinable and people do understand and do know. We also look at the trainer who is training. So if the trainer doesn't really know <laughs> what they're talking about, we also need to understand that. So as the Good Governance Academy, we have got on our website um, recommended training and endorsed training. And we look at both the, um, the trainer and the training organization and the program that they are um, producing. And the one that we recommend on ISO 37000 is the uh, one by Fluid Rock. Um, and that's the one on our website. So with that, I know I'm two minutes over. I'd like to thank you for my time, for your time, and for welcoming you uh, me into your home. And I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion now. So thank you, Kamla. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. That was such an excellent presentation. I, I can tell you, I certainly have a much, much better understanding of ISO 37000 now. Um, and, and I really am looking forward to um, understanding more, particularly as you mentioned at the end, the fact that you know there are opportunities for persons to be trained in understanding the, the standard a lot better as well. So at this point, I'm very happy we have two persons who, who are extremely versed in corporate governance who uh, will be able to share on their perspective now on in understanding the standard better. Um, the first is Rona, Ronel Dayton Baird. Uh, Ronel leads the PwC corporate services practice in the Caribbean region for PwC. She is an attorney at law and a fellow of the Chartered Governance Institute of Canada. Um, and our second panelist is a former chairman of CCGI, that's uh, Ronnie Bissessa. Ronnie is also an attorney at law in private practice. Um, and he is also um, uh, on the boards of several uh, state enterprises and um, uh, private organizations as well. So I would encourage everyone to look at the details of the bio of our panelists, as I have encouraged you for our presenters as well, so we don't spend too much time there, but to go directly into um, our panel presentation and then the discussion which would follow. So Ronel, I would like to invite you first to let's hear from you in five to 10 minutes, your thoughts and feedback on what you've heard from Carolyn this morning. Thank you, Kamla. Um, Carolyn, thank you as always, yet again, for showing that you, you live and you breathe this. I've said this to Carolyn before, that it's, when she speaks, it's, it's so clear that on a daily basis, she lives and breathes this. She is very much a governance geek. I aspire to, to get to that point as well. <laughs> um, so thanks again, Carolyn, for you know, really painting a picture of, of what ISO 37000 is and what it seeks to achieve, building on the initiatives over the last few decades, building on you know, where we started from with the OECD principles, what we've tried to build on each jurisdiction with codes, but taking this governance approach to a different level, focusing on the areas of sustainability, of double um, materiality, of making sure that we encourage organizations, not just, as you said, companies, but all organizations to focus centrally on what their purpose is and what the organization's values are as a driving force for how everything else is then approached within the context of both um, internal issues and, and what the impact of the organization is externally. Um, I think it's, it's, an, it's an approach that shows the strong evolution of governance. I know that ISOs or ISOs um, focus is on trade, but I think it really does allow us as a governance focused community to take the discussion to the next level because it really is so important for us to encourage our organizations. And yes, from my perspective, mostly our companies to focus on that central purpose. Um, within the Caribbean, of course, that's no different. 
um, what I try to, I'm trying to wrap my mind around listening to you and understanding where we are internationally is what does this mean for us within the region? Knowing that our companies, yes, our organizations generally, but again, I'm speaking mainly to our companies are operating in a very volatile environment. That's the case globally, but within the region, we have been so hard hit in terms of, of COVID and what this has meant for our tourism products and our economies generally, um, that it's to get the attention of our governing bodies to the importance, looking at the importance of resetting possibly their purpose and their value when they're in very often right now in survival mode allowing them to get the mind space as governing bodies, as individual directors and as a collective, how do we drive that discussion um, to allow them to see the value of, of taking a step back and understanding if they need to or to what extent they need to reset their purpose and their organizational values, knowing that that is going to lead to long-term sustainability, again, while they are in immediate survival mode. So that's the stage I am at trying to have those types of discussions with our own governing bodies. And I would love to hear a bit more from both you and Ronnie um, as to what your thoughts are there, how we drive those discussions, how we allow our boards um, to reflect on how we got our, the position that we're currently at and what it's going to take for us to move forward in a more sustainable manner. Um, we are in the process of doing our preliminary analysis of our regional PwC governance survey results. Um, the first one was done pure, purely focused on Barbados directors a few years ago. And this survey, I'm pleased to say, is regionally focused. So we have surveyed directors in Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia, Grenada, Trinidad, um, across the region, as many territories as we were able to touch. And the preliminary feedback that I'm seeing is an acknowledgement to some extent of the need to have these discussions and to take this step back, um, but not necessarily that steps are currently being taken. So there's the acknowledgement, which is where we need to start, but it is the next, the steps toward um, taking a wider view of value, accepting the reality of our stakeholder group being a very wide one, acknowledging the fact that um, as, as Prof King very, you know, aptly says, um, that capital is provided not just by shareholders, but also by the environment and by society. I'm seeing a greater acknowledgement of these things, but not necessarily that, that steps are currently being taken um, to fully addressing what that should mean for the long-term sustainability of our organization. So that's the next step. And it's in driving those discussions and making those things real in the boardroom um, and then driving that down to management is, is where I think we are, we are within the Caribbean. Um, and of course, the more our corporations um, seek to trade internationally, an approach in line with, with ISO 37000 becomes that much more important because again, they are going to increasingly be judged on that playing field, regardless of the level of, of the state of our economies, that is going to increasingly become the benchmark. Um, so it's, it's encouraging and supporting our, our boards in, in taking that, that, those initial steps and, and along um, that, that course in terms of their journey. So Kamla with that. I'll hand over to Ronnie. And by the way, Ronnie, I'm also a Ronnie. Many people call me Ronnie, so that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Ronald. That, that was um, a really good. And we're certainly looking forward to learning more about the results of the PwC survey. So now we'd invite Ronnie um, to share his 10 minutes on uh, the ISO 37,000 uh, standard as shared by Carolyn this morning. Thank you very much, Kamala, and of course um, uh, to um, Carolyn and, and Ronell. It's, it's, it's such a great pleasure to be part of what is a very rich discussion. And, uh, and, and, and I really, you know, I'm looking forward to the involvement of the other members of, on, on the chat so that we can really go deeper into this and to also, in fact, um, incorporate a lot of what um, um, Ronell has said and 
perhaps using her expression, getting our authorities to take a wider view of value, which I, I do accept is, is something which can is, is critical to the sustainability of all our organizations. Um, I listen very carefully to, um, to, to, to Carolyn. And I must say, it's always a joy to, to listen to somebody who is really at the top of their, of their, of their profession on what they're doing. And, and what I extracted from her presentation is really three points. I mean, there are quite a few, but I've highlighted three of them, which I, I wish to just drill down a little bit further as it pertains specifically to the Caribbean perspective. Um, the, the first point I wanted to underscore um, is, is that as, as Carolyn noted, the ISO 37,000, even though it bears the, the expression of the name standard, is, is not intended to be prescriptive, but really guiding, broad guiding principles on the basis that boards and uh, companies work very differently. Uh, in, in, and it's not a case where one size fits all. Um, I, I, the reason I wanted to underscore that is that I think our, our very unique Caribbean corporate culture means that we have so many different organizations, um, different levels of, uh, of governance, and even different levels of management. And I'm careful to say that because I do remember um, Carolyn saying that ISO 37,000 really highlights governance and not management. Um, from a Caribbean focus, sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish between both. And, um, and I do feel that from a Caribbean point of view, um, we, we do need to highlight some aspects of, of, of both because really we are relying on management to take the governance principles down and through the bosom of the company and really into the innards of the company. It seems to me on that very first point that, um, that for ISO 37 to have an impact locally and perhaps regionally, it must mean that boards must accept and not delegate the responsibility of ensuring that governance is in fact board driven. And it, they may do this by appointing the appropriate committee to make recommendations on, um, on devising a governance model perhaps culled from ISO 37,000 by which their organization is best able to, to be managed um, and, and to be measured um, because of course the, the metric is, is equally important. And, and in, 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 in listen to Carolyn, I was thinking to myself, it means that boards should very carefully review 37,000 and extract those governance principles, which they feel can be aligned to their individual organization's uh, business and affairs and define its governance philosophy. It seems a very deep, almost, uh, almost a conceptual discussion, but I, I think we really ought to move away from, 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 from those notions of concept and, 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 and generic qualities to actual hard thinking on what our businesses and organizations are, are doing and whether or not we can, in fact, incorporate a governance model driven by ISO 37000 that not only in, increases value, and, and in that I, I, I share um, Ronel's point that we must encourage our decision makers to take a wider view of value, but also to improve our, our governance standards. Um, I, and this is where, of course, the integrity that, that, um, that Carolyn spoke of um, is, is critical. So the first point I wanted to highlight is that um, while this is a governance model, it is not um, one that is um, that that you know cannot be adjusted to reflect the the commercial realities of our business cultures in the Caribbean. But what it does mean is that boards and management are required to look very carefully at at ISO thirty seven and 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 take from it those aspects of, of the governance um, principles, which best is best suited to its, its own particular organization. And, and therefore that means it's not one size fits all. And, um, and, and we should jettison those, you know, impractical notions of what constitutes good governance and really focus on our actual business and operations in each of these organizations to see whether it is a good fit and to measure whether it is in fact a good fit. And this, of course, I think we can all you know, agree is not a box ticking exercise. It must follow deep and lengthy board driven discussions as to what governance principles and strategies um, are, are most relevant to the organization's business. Um, the, the second point I wanted to highlight um, is also driven by, um, by, by what um, Carolyn and, and Ronel also mentioned, and that while governance is board driven, 
it really must infuse the entire organization in order for the organization to be sustainable. In many respects, and um, uh, our boards of directors, um, you know, um, are maybe very familiar with the current notions of what constitutes good governance, but are, are unable or perhaps reluctant um, to, to, to infuse their entire organization with those notions. And, and therefore, it seems to me that a, a proper governance structure culled from 37,000 requires accountability at all levels, which means that not just the top layers, but middle and lower uh, management um, must, must be trained and be exposed to these governance models. And, and in fact, metrics be determined and devised that will allow us to determine whether or not they are being satisfactorily implemented. Having said that, I am very wary that, as that, as um, as 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 uh, you know, as as uh, Carolyn mentioned, that um, ISO thirty-seven thousand is not intended to be management-driven, but really governance-driven. Having said that, I, I want to just make the point that because governance in 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 the Caribbean is generally treated and regarded um, as as management-driven, rather even than board-driven. It does mean that um, that we should infuse our entire culture with these notions of what constitutes good governance, and that really means that in in devising uh, em employment contracts and 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 and, um, and job descriptions, that we should incorporate quite expressly um, the training that will expose our managers and our employees to to what constitutes good governance and to measure their performance in terms of the metrics so that we can determine whether we should reward good governance training and the implementation of good governance practices. Um, and, and therefore it follows that, um, that, that uh, appropriately incentivized schemes uh, should be deter de devised by, by, by directors um, and managers. So that it means in effect that not only the boards of directors but the faces and voices of the organization are familiar with the, these governance um, principles are not just fam familiar with them, but are incentivized to actually implement them because they can, you know, determine that there is in fact value from these organizations, from, from these things. And, and that takes me to the third point very quickly, which is really value. And, and I was very interested, you know, in, in for instance, um, what Ronel was saying about value, um, because it's something that I've been privately fighting with my corporate clients for, for many years that value is not just to be treated as an economic construct or a bottom line thinking, but value um, speaks to really the business culture, the culture of the organization. And I had a, was very interested in, the, in, the, um, in, in, in what um, um, Carolyn had put up, which shows in effect that over a 40 year period, I believe from the 70s to 1970s to 2020, that the, 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 the value of the organization is measured in terms of indirect revenues, um, it greatly exceeds that from actual assets or actual revenues. And that is the right, um, the, the right trend. But in order for that trend to, 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 to materialize, it means that organizations must be alive to the fact that they can create value and encourage value simply by doing what is right. Um, and of course, 37,000 encourages good ethical behavior and, and, and that's embedded in the philosophy, but it also means that we must walk the talk. So it follows that, um, that in implementing a methodology or a model, whether driven specifically by um, 37,000 or culled from it, that we do take steps to, to fashion our business and affairs from that. So it's not just a box ticking exercise, but one that is indelibly part of and will become part of our culture. Um, I made a very brief note when, um, when, when Carolyn was going through, where she said that ISO 37000 incorporates those notions in the expression integrated governance, which refers to delegation, management, sustainability, and, and, and stakeholder arrangements. And I, I, it's an excellent expression, integrated governance, which with, with, um, with the permission um, from ISO 37, I plan to use because I do feel that it really properly reflects the prioritization that should be given to values as part of the corporate and business culture, or perhaps I should say the organization's culture. And culture itself it has to be sustained and ought, and ought to be sustained if everyone buys into that particular cultural norms. Um, so, so um, with th those are my, my, my the points that I wanted to just um, to to raise. Um, 
I am minded that, um, that uh, as, as we talked about 37,000 is principle-based, not rule-based. And even though the requirements are permissive rather than mandatory, um, I just wanted to end on the basis that the Trinidad Tobago Bureau of Standards, which is our local standards body, um, is in fact actively um, consulting with stakeholders in relation to its intention to develop the ISO, ISO 37000 with appropriate adjustments necessarily to be part of our uh, a voluntary code or voluntary standard. Um, I mean, I, I think we should, uh, the CCGI for instance, should make take act, an active role in, um, in trying to persuade the Trent Bigger Bureau of Standards to in, in due course develop it into a compulsory standard. But we know, do know that there is a, um, a process involved there. And of course, not just locally, but the, um, the, car but, but the various, the, the, I think it's CrossQ, which is Barbados based, which is the regional standards body, um, can, can do the same thing, you know, um, and, and take ISO 37000 and, and let it be fashion our, um, our, our governance models based on it. And let it be, let, let us in fact be measured by how effectively we perform in accordance with ISO 37. So, um, Kamala, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Yes, indeed, it was um, extremely helpful, um, particularly as you pointed out that the Bureau of Standards here in Trinidad and Tobago is in the midst of their exercise. And in reality, um, the Trinidad and Tobago Corporate Governance Code, uh, there will be moves to revise that code next year. And so it's all coming together in a nice timely fashion for us to be guided by a lot of what is captured here in ISO 37,000. Um, but I also agree with you, Ronnie, in terms of the need to train, not just our directors, but throughout the organization, ensure that all our managers and supervisors have an appreciation of um, ISO 37,000. So we all are working together towards the same uh, objectives. Um, so I want to open the floor at this point, if anyone would like to ask any questions, you, you can raise your hands uh, virtually, or uh, you may type it in the chat feature that we may still uh, ask you to ask the question um, directly, but we'd be very happy to have you participate in the conversation um, from now. Um, I, I want to tell you, Carolyn, I absolutely love the, the model, the governance model, which was captured here as, as part of uh, ISO 37000. Um, as you said, you know, the, the primary part, which is the, the purpose, um, but also captures the organizational values. Um, but those of us who, who are academics as well, totally love that second circle where all of those practices that we are familiar with, you know, Professor Bob Tricker's. Uh, policies, practices, and, and um, guidelines, which has taught many MBA um, students across the globe. Uh, it's all captured in the, the, the model generally for us to see how it can all come together. Um, so I would certainly be looking forward to being able to understand it with more depth, you know, and, and to share with my students as well. So I don't want to hug the, um, the screen, though I can, because I, I can have a, a great conversation with, um, with Ronel, Roddy, and um, Carolyn here. But I do want to encourage persons, if you have any questions at all, or if you have any comments, um, we'd be very happy to have you participate in the conversation. Um, Kamala, if we haven't heard from anyone yet, I just wanted to touch on something that, that Ronnie mentioned, the need for our boards. I, I very much do see this as, as being board driven. Um, um, and I support Ronnie's comment that this then needs to be drilled down into management. So two, two positive things I, I can touch on Ronnie to give us a little bit of hope. Only this week, actually, um, one of our larger regional um, companies their board was insistent that um, governance training and discussions that we plan to have with them next week, that as a precursor to that, they felt it was imperative that their management team across their group um, get similar training and their own opportunities to have those very important discussions about governance and what that means for them as a management team in supporting the board and in driving the values um, and the purpose of the organization. 
So it's a small win, but it's a win. It's, win. it's mm. one organization, but it's a step in the right direction. And, and the, the type of discussion that was had with that management team and the investment that they made in time, um, the input that they gave, I, I found very encouraging. Um, mm. And then the other small win, I think, is, is the hope that, that I have um, that in IFRS, taking these steps over the last couple of months, and Carolyn and I have, have had some discussions about that that I found very useful, um, that with many of our, our companies relying on, on, on IFRS standards, that that has to have some level of impact in driving the discussion purely because there will be some level of reporting that has to happen. Um, the, you know, we don't know how quickly everything will be you know, finalized. We don't know the immediate impact um, within the region, but certainly our accounting bodies are, are taking note. They know that this is coming. Those discussions are starting to happen within boardrooms. The fact that some level of reporting is going to be required. And so we need to wrap our heads around this. What are we doing and are we doing enough? And more importantly, you know, that, that then has to drive a, a, a deeper discussion with boards that we're not encouraging you to be prepared to fill out a form and to have just to have something to report. But instead, the fact that this is coming is a wake up call as to how real this is. And the fact that this needs to be an integral part of your purpose, of your vision, of your strategy, because mm -hmm. ultimately what you report, you want this to be real. You want this to be meaningful and actually be an integral part of what your business is doing. Um, so the fact that that's coming in another year, year and a half, we're not 100% mm -hmm. sure, um, but that I think also helps to drive the right discussions. Mm -hmm. And just so that's, to, that's, to add that's, to that, that, sorry, Ronnie, you know, just to right add to that, that <laughs> um, so governance does happen at the governing body level. But we do talk in 37,000 in the definition about governing groups. And that's recognition that there are executive groups, management groups throughout the organization that do, that do have a level of accountability and authority and responsibilities that look and feel like governance. Um, certainly the governing body is the ultimate body that's pushing it down. And that the direction needs to come from that, from the board level, but it does get pushed down. So it is good and it's important that all levels of specifically management understand what's happening. It is a different level of maturity. Um, the level of maturity from what we, what we can call it the tribal leader, which is the, the chief of something versus a legacy builder, which is the governing body kind of, of level. So getting an understanding of that different mindset is really important. I think maybe just another thing to say um, is that the standards written, it's not intended that any of the principles take, are taken out. Um, all the principles hang together in a, a specific way. Um, the principles can be added to, um, but the practices, the key aspects of practices are are just um, for, they're not, they're not, com uh, they are fairly comprehensive and they're the basis on which the key aspects, uh, the, the practices should be applied, but the practices themselves are, are not. So we're saying the principles kind of are one size fits all, but the practices are definitely not. Um, it's guidance. Um, so that, that's just a little bit about that, but I, I thought I just wanted to land on a point and a friend of mine said this to me. He said that um, what he did was he took boards through a visual image and he showed them a, a, a murmuration. You know, this when the birds fly together and they make those patterns in the sky. And he asked the board, what do you, what do you see? And so they were all described. Blah, blah, blah. And, he, and he basically landed and he said, it's beautiful, right? And they all said, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's just, it's a miracle. It's, it's beautiful. And he said, that's actually what good governance looks like. There's no management going on there. That's just good governance. And since he said that to me, I just, I get it. Um, good governance is beautiful. Um, it just hangs together. It works together. Um, there's no hiccups. There's no speed bumps in the road. So I've, the only reason why I'm in governance is because when, when I've learned, and I learned the hard lessons about what governance is, through being in, a, in an investment company, a large investment company, um, really wherever I went, I applied those principles. And I found that I could do, I could do things 
um, faster, cheaper, because everybody was on the same page. Everybody understood what needed to be done. Everybody was in line, in tune, just like those murmurations. So um, in a crisis, good governance will help you work faster and work smarter. Whereas good, go bad governance is like, you know, trying to drive on a dirt road. You're driving on a, on a, a tar road when you've got good governance. You're driving on a dirt road with uncertainty if you don't. So I just thought those images maybe... Um, they, they drive me, so they could be useful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Caroline. In fact, I, I, as you speak to it, too, I'm, I'm actually seeing that in the model as well, where the very outer circle, when we talk about the outcomes, I, I think we all need to understand that and, and really be able to, to drive the discussion in such a way that we're all focused on having that coming together of, of the board and the management team, as uh, Ronald described as well, um, to ensure we get the outcomes that we want from good governance. Uh, so I saw Vindel had his hand up. I'd like to invite him now to um, ask his question or, or make a comment. Thank you very much, Kamala. And I just want to say um, thank you to all three uh, presenters thus far. They, they were quite clear. Uh, Caroline, with respect to the, the, the new corporate governance standard, it is my understanding from your presentation that it's voluntary, it's generic, while it's industry specific, you say it's more relevant for international trade. Against the background of the various uh, company forms in the different jurisdictions, yes? Do you plan to, in, an, in any way, shape or form, promulgate this as in marketing, you know, to get some buying at any stage? And if so, how are you go, um, going to achieve that when in fact, many of our companies, both listed public bodies and private, they do have one form or another of their specific corporate governance codes. And of course, different quality uh, specifications based on their different industries. So how will this be sold? Mm. Mm. So it really very good, very good. So I just like to think of the the general data protection regulation in the EU. Um, it's just it's just an EU. Um, we've got nothing to do with the EU, but we all comply with the GDPR. Why? Because we trade with the EU. Um, so if you're wanting to trade, or if you're wanting international funding for a nonprofit, or if you want any kind of, if you're in any kind of global situation, the only benchmark that is available in terms of assessing whether you, or, or looking at your governance of your organization, and we see that that is like 90% of the value is in, in intangibles, is going to be ISO 37,000, because there is nothing else. It is the international benchmark. Um, so in South Africa, we've got lots of multinationals that work throughout Africa. We've got um, organizations that have uh, African organizations that are in um, you know, Kenyan organizations that have branches in South Africa. So we are, are very multinational. And do you comply or do you apply the principles in King 4? Or do you use the Kenyan code or the Botswana code? Or what do you use? Well, the commonality is ISO 37,000 now. ISO doesn't promote. Um, so ISO won't go out and they've got newsletters and they do their standard promotions. But really, it's just through uh, international adoption. And the fact that we have 77 countries, 83 inter international liaison organizations, um, it's coming. So they're just preparing their, um, you know, I, I told you about one course that the GGA had endorsed. We're not exclusive. So that's one. Um, it's just the first that's off, off to market. But when the others come, we will be endorsing them just as well. Um, so I don't, I think this is going to snowball. I think the, the how, what are we now in December, the three months that we've had um, since it was published is three months that people are in preparation now. Um, so it's, it's not compulsory. It is guidance, but there's no other guidance that's available internationally. So, yeah, it's going, it has to snowball. Thank, Thank you. you.
Carolyn. And, and, and if I may add, I mean, the, the role of um, institutes like ours, the, the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institutes, and I know most of the governance institutes globally are also looking to do their own uh, invitations of persons like Caroline so that we all have a better appreciation and understanding of um, ISO 37. Thousand, so we can help our own organizations to also be able to understand how it fits within their own uh, construct. Because, as um, Caroline said, you know, being principle based, it means that you have to be able to uh, fit it within what uh, existing regulations and so apply in your region and the particular form for your company. And, and, and this is one of the things that I, I absolutely love about governance. You know, you cannot hold it down and say, okay, now I know what it is. It's, it's pretty much like what Carolyn um, said when she described the whole issue of, um, of that, that outer part of the circle in terms of getting the stewardship and ethical behaviors and effective performance together. It's not about passing the exam. It's about really having that experience and continually trying to do your best because the environment constantly changes. You know, the world is not static and it's not going to wait for you to say, okay, now I get it. So I, I understand what it's about. As soon as you do, something is going to happen. And, and possibly COVID-19 is the biggest example we can have right now that talks about those kinds of impacts. Um, Carol, I see your hand up. I'm, I'm very happy to invite you to be part of the discussion as well. So your comment or question, please. Yes, good day, everyone. Um, Carolyn, that was an absolutely stimulating presentation and also contribution of the panelists has been excellent. Carolyn, you were very careful to say that the current standard doesn't cover political governance or state governance. But when I consider that many of the regulatory bodies and other significant entities, certainly in our region, are statutory corporations, I would love you to share your views on how applicable this standard is and, and whether or not you would highly encourage its, its adoption um, by these entities. Absolutely, I highly encourage it. I know that there are going to be restrictions because they are legislative bodies. So there's legislation that guides um, the composition of the board, for example. Generally, you've got appointments by ministers, et cetera, on, on the board. So there's certain legislation that you, you can't apply, um, you know, all the guidance and the standard. But the principles themselves on how to govern that organization are equally as applicable. It's just that the standard doesn't talk to it. The standard doesn't talk to um, specific missions of the organization, that the organization is um, a legislative body. So um, I, think, I think that's the only, the only differentiation. Um, perhaps the other level is that at a, govern, at a state level, the state establishes policies that are not the policies that you talk about in governance. So we use the term policy, meaning a, a policy that takes a... Um, a principle and applies the principle in the organization. Now, that's not the policy that you speak about at a, at a state level because it's so much higher than that. Um, and its applicability is, is so much more than that. So I think that that's a, it's a terminology issue. It's the fact that we're not talking about anything to do with compliance um, in, in um, being a restriction on this. So that's why, but it is, it's absolutely applicable. It, it definitely, Carol, it's applicable. Um, I know because with our state-owned entities, we're looking at applying it in our state-owned entities. Thank you very much. And it's encouraging because you said that it did get the nod of the OECD. And, you know, we are constantly in a battle to stay off a list. So, you know, the more compliant we are, the better it is for all of us. Thank you. Carol, that's when you talk about a, a, a constantly evolving environment, there's none greater than... <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Carol, the point, the point that you're making, I think, is we, we probably can drill, drill down a little more on it because, in effect, uh, in our Caribbean society, we are really rule based. You know, we were principle based at a point, but now with the intrusiveness of comp of compliance and regulatory conduct, 
it means in effect that we, we, we are required to comply with certain requirements and, and generally we're rule-based. And it seems to me that one of the challenges that we face in encouraging as many organizations as possible to, to infuse them their, their, their business and affairs with a, a, a structure or a model very much as ISO 37000 is the very same fuzziness that uh, Kamala was alluding to, the, where you, 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 the, the edges are indistinct. By its very notion, we know when a company or an organization is, is governed properly because we know um, it, it's not possible generally to measure it with a metric that's acceptable. And, and it seems to me my practice is that, uh, and perhaps is a small win using Ronell's example, is that I'm able to persuade a, a very influential director of a company to, uh, and, a, and a very well-run company to accept one of the, 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 the model, the ISO 37,000 model or something akin to that. But the questions that I had to answer uh, or the answers that I had to give him had to be based on what was in it for him. In other words, bottom line, he was looking at it from a risk management point of view. Look, I need to sell this to my board. I, I understand the legacy point. I want to be a part of a well-run organization but I have to respond to my directors and my board, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and therefore we have to sell it. And the question then is in uh, what do we do to sell it other than the fact that you feel better about being part of such a company. And since we all, we have to deal with things in the short and medium term, it means that I really must set out a formula that says in five years, if you do this, then you're likely to have a greater value to ascribe to your company, the wealth of your company. And in fact, the fact that your company will have a better investment climate because everybody wants to associate with that company for those reasons. And, 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 and it follows, it seems to me, that in order to persuade companies to adopt um, ISO 37000, we need to be able to reduce some of this fuzziness. And, and encourage them to think about it in terms of what we can provide or what it can provide for them. And, and that's why I think ISO 37000 is very important in establishing a benchmark, as you said, the very first one. And I certainly hope Trinidad Tobago will be num uh, number 78 on your list, um, you know, to, to, to really get, get on board in terms of that. Yes. Well, Trinidad and Tobago were the co-conveners of, of this working group. So yeah. very much that, uh, TT's on board. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just in answer to um, the point about rules, uh, rules really are society's minimum standards and, um, and that's changing. So there's a minimum standard, but society never holds you to that. Um, they hold you to more than that. And that's where organizations slip up. So absolutely, if you want to get involved in, in litigation, um, you know, you can comply with the minimum standards and you wait till the organization next to you does something wrong. That's really where the compliance comes from. I, I have this all the time because being a consultant, you know, pretty much all my life, <laughs> the issue is that how can you sell governance? You because people don't have to do governance, people have to do compliance. So that's an easy sell. But more and more in today's world, I, I'm in, I've got an IT technology background and the technology legislation we know is so far behind um, the, what people are expecting. We just saw now that um, with artificial intelligence, we've got DNA computing, um, we've got DNA based um, hard, hard drives, et cetera. So, um, which are life perpetual. So now where's the ethics in that? Well, there's no legislation around that. So there's very difficult things that we, we're working into in society in our rapid pace of evolution that, that rules are a minimum and it's for the people at the back. You know, the people in the front that are the innovators need to do more, need to do more than that. Um, so that's that's just the one thing, and and I'm I'm kind of <laughs> this is not just me with my you know uh, my thinking. This is this is because we've had these discussions at ISO. We've we've had these um, hard, uh, detailed discussions with all these different stakeholders um, to come to an end point. So this is just I'm actually paraphrasing what <laughs> our discussion. So. Um, and there, there was another point around um, the Trinidad and Tobago in terms of its, its changing environment. And absolutely, in South Africa, we get it. Um, so I mean, one of the events I'd like to do, and I, I chat, chatted to uh, Ronell about it, is um, Lesotho in South Africa. So Ronell didn't know where Lesotho was. <laughs> Lesotho is a tiny landlocked um, kingdom 
in South Africa, um, or, or South Africa surrounds it, um, and it's older than South Africa, and um, it has just launched its own corporate governance code, and it exactly exactly the same kind of issues is that you know you have um the board doesn't need to get on board you know they meet four times a year they get paid to meet they barely open their packs before the meeting um that's the general norm so how do you shift how do you shift this general norm and show them that you can be even more you can produce more you can work faster you can work smarter you can be more agile more innovative if you have this murmuration um, and you're not just plodding the plodding the road. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting um, to have a look at. I think the develop developing world is going to be pushing the needle on this um, because the developed world is so um, instilled in its cultural approaches to um, the Sarbanes Oxleys of the world um, that we know that those rules have, haven't paid off. <laughs> you know, we still get bad behavior. Um, so these old economies are going to struggle with this new agile globalization um, that we see and, and these existential threats, you know, being innovative. Uh, absolutely. Kamla, I'd love to hear from, from both Carolyn and, and Ronnie on a thought that I, I've been having more and more. So Professor Garrett touched on this yesterday. We've heard Peter speak in, you know, in very strong terms in ter with respect to the younger generation. Their absolute lack of tolerance for corporations not doing right by society and not doing right by the environment. The same way we look at these, you know, the wealthy families and we see this generational shift that Peter has spoken about um, having a major impact on, on the world. It's the same way the average young person, in my view, is going to have a major impact on what our companies do and don't do. So Rani, part of the conversation that, that I have with, with um, companies is, it's not only why should I do this, but what will happen if I don't? <laughs> How will I be viewed by that customer base, by that talent pool, um, neither of which are going to be interested in my business if I am not seen to be doing the right thing? Kamala, you can see that with your, your daughter, I'm sure. The yes. lack of tolerance they have for nonsense. Carolyn, same for you with your, your kids. And my daughter may be a bit younger, but at 13, I can already see the passion. I can already see the, the disdain for, for behavior that, that they just will not tolerate. And so it may be, it's one thing for current boards to talk about, um, you know, five years from now, this will, will this really have an impact on me? But they're looking at that through, through the lens of, of our generation. The next generation has a completely different view and a tolerance level that is non-existent when it comes to, to the way companies operate. So I, I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that, but to me, that is a major shift that if it's not really taken into consideration by our boards, they're going to miss the mark. Yeah, thank you, Ronel. Uh, as uh, Carolyn and, and Ronnie gather their thoughts to respond to that, um, I do want to acknowledge in this forum um, Dr. Axel Kravitsky, who is the founder and chairman for the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. And Carolyn mentioned him earlier. He actually is the co-convener for this ISO 37,000 standard. So we are very much involved in a very deep way in the whole evolution of governance practices, you know. So I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware, you know, Dr. Kravitsky's role in, in all of this as founder and chairman of CCGI. So um, Ronnie and, and Carolyn, over to go to you now with respect to Ronald's question and, and our Gen Zs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll just go quickly. Um, firstly, I'm so happy that Axel is part of the discussion. I, I can't think of a better contributor than, than Axel. Axel, it's a pleasure having you here. Um, I, I think, um, Ronel, you, you identified the, the problem and the solution because I think, and, and the same experiences that you had with your daughter, I have with my, I have a 14 year old and an eight year old. Actually, she's 14 going on 19 because she's taken command of her. And, 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 and the word of disdain that you've used is apt. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, an, it's an intolerance born out of the uh, re realization that the world ought not to be tolerant of people who behave badly or who are ethically uh, uh, you know, challenged. And, and, and more than that, it is that we are demanding standards that are, are aligned to our behavior and not the other way around. Uh, and, and it seems to me that, that progressive chairs and, and directors of companies are alive to this or ought to be alive to this. And in their projections of three to five years down the road, they must take into account the fact that the, the base that they are serving are these demographics and they will be intolerant of, of not only poor standard and poor service, but poor governance. And therefore, in fact, I have used that as the basis for reaching out to companies to change how they do things. So it's not just a, a chairman looking for a good legacy, but in fact, it's a good business proposition that you inculcate these proper management practices and practices that will encourage it and, and increase your value and, and of course your revenues. So, so I, that in fact, I think is, is, is the point. So I, it's an excellent point, Renal. I'm glad you raised it and, and that would have been my on it. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just echoing what Ronnie says. I, I haven't got anything to add, it, it, exactly the same. And uh, interestingly, um, I didn't know that Axel had founded the, the CCGR. <laughs> okay, yes, that, yes, that's interesting. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thank you, I, I haven't got anything to add, absolutely. Okay, so we do have um, a comment in the chat. Oh, it's from Brenda. Um, Brenda says, this reminds me of Greta Thunberg's speech at, uh, at the UN. How dare you, she said to the mm -hmm. world. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely, Brenda. Um, so I, I'm just letting everyone know again, we are in the Q&A segment. We have uh, just under 10 minutes remaining. If anyone else wanted to um, make a comment or, or ask a question or so, we would very happily welcome you. Um, to be part of the conversation here. Professor Garrett. I just wanted to mention something that I forgot to mention. It was to Ronnie's point. Um, it's about measuring. Um, there are two standards currently under development. Um, well, there are actually three um, around this. The one is um, indicators of good governance. And they are creating, there's two pieces of work for that. One is um, creating, uh, understanding what a good indicator is, and then actually creating indicators for governance. Um, then the other one is uh, on governance maturity model, and I'm co-convening that. So um, the South African approach to to governance um, is really on a maturity basis, so levels of maturity and appropriateness. You spoke very um clearly about what's appropriate for an organization, Ronnie, and that's absolutely right. So um, making sure that you're not aiming for a maturity level five, that's not appropriate for your organization. Um, and then the third one is on, um, it's called um, governance efficiency, which is interesting. It's under development. It's, um, it's convened um, by a Russian, um, by the Russian delegation. Um, and it talks about efficiency. Um, I'm not in, involved in that um, at, at this stage. Um, I do need to be. But those are the three pieces of work that are currently underway to provide some kind of measures around governance. Because as you say, Ronnie, um, you know, what's the point if you're doing this airy, fairy, fuzzy stuff and you can't actually measure or account or report on, on exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it. So absolutely agree with you. Sorry, you, uh, Ronell, you're going to ask Prof Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to hear, hear him. It's a little too quiet for my liking. <laughs> I was just very impressed with the quality of the whole thing. So I'm delighted. Um, in fact, actually, um, to flatter you, I'll pick up your uh, 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 phrase um, as you're getting the results in from the Caribbean survey that, um, and I think this is true of everybody, including the old economies, that there is now uh, a, a very large acknowledgement of the issues, but very little idea how to move forward. Um, and I think ISO, you know, is, it will be one particularly good way to do that. I also think that the work that Professor King is doing on the uh, generally accepted uh, corporate governance reporting system 
uh, is absolutely crucial. But if we can begin to also set up a world standard, and it seems to be uh, surprisingly uh, well advanced, even if the US and China um, uh, are not playing at the moment. But if, if the rest of the world starts delivering um, a standardized, very clear, very open system of report, company reporting and audit, then um, people are just going to have to begin to say, we've got to do this. It's crazy not to. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, that, that's my feeling that uh, around the world, we're, we're reaching sometimes grudging, um, but grudging acknowledgement that now something has to be done. Yeah, that's where I am. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Garrett, you know, um, but, but it reminds me a little bit of what uh, uh, Bob Tricker wrote in, in his book as well, where he, he, he said for the, the 30 years or so that um, we have had the Cadbury report, um, persons have tried in many different ways to be able to capture, you know, what, what is that exact thing that would lead you to have an, um, you know, an, uh, an effective board and a successful organization. And um, one of the things that I, I found very intriguing about um, what you wrote was that you, you just cannot put your finger on what it is that um, gains investors confidence on a daily basis, you know, because so long as investors feel happy with your organization, you know, they, they'd be there. And then whatever contributes to their thinking, okay, no, I, I no longer have confidence in this organization, it, it, it moves off. Um, and it's something therefore for us to guard jealously how do we ensure that we are demonstrating on that consistent basis that the organization is, is valuing um, its, its stakeholders and it's committed to good governance. Um, and, and that whole process I find to be absolutely fascinating. Well, that's from the external view, but what worries me more is the internal view. Um, how many company chairmen I've spoken with, but in the last few years, two prime ministers, um, all of whom took me aside, wanted a private dinner, and began by saying, I have no idea what I'm meant to be doing. Absolutely yes, not. <laughs> and, and, yes, that, and, and that was because they were dropped into a position for which they had had no training, mm. no development. There really weren't the rule books around, which is why I think what ISO focusing on governance is so important. But it begins to give a level of um, performance at the very top levels, a specif specification of performance at the very top levels. And I mean, if I took, if I took either of those prime ministers uh, out in public and said, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I will be out of the country or in jail very rapidly indeed. Um, but uh, uh, privately, these folks are saying help. Mm. And I think people on this network can, uh, across the world can begin to give that help. Thank you very much, Professor Garrett. Um, yes, indeed. Um, and, and, and it's all part of what we are, are doing and growing together as well. And uh, Professor Garrett, for anyone who is new um, in our session today, Professor Garrett has been leading us with the development of an international learning network where we come together every two months uh, because it is so important for us to engage these conversations together. Because just as he described what happens you know, with prime ministers, we can all relate to knowing uh, directors and, and a chairman of boards who are placed in a, a position and then, you know, they, they really need um, some direction and guidance as to what really their role and function is um, from that point onwards. And you hope so, they ask you. <laughs> <laughs> you hope they ask you because if they don't, then they're not the interested. Results, <laughs> we see, that's right. Now, we see some end results that we absolutely don't want. Mm. So it's it's actually 12 p.m. now, so I'd like us to wrap up this session. Um, so I'm going to ask... <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, I know. Eh? We could have had this conversation going for another hour. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask each of the, the panelists first to share their, their uh, closing comments, and, and we'll uh, go back to Carolyn and end of the uh, session with her closing comments. So, um, Ronnie, would you like to uh, start? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kamala. And very briefly, I, th I think this has been extraordinarily uh, a very rich discussion. I, what I pulled out from it, and, 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 and I'm grateful to, for Carolyn for such a, a very lucid introduction to what is a very complex subject, is, is really that, that ISO 37000 is principle-based, not rule-based. Its purpose is to facilitate in, international trade. And I, I must say, I wrestled with that for a little while. Um, it it's relates to governance and, and not management principally. Um, it creates and improves wealth, uh, value, and, and I, I picked up the, the, the topic or the notion of value generation, which I hadn't before, but I do appreciate the context in which it applies now. And, um, and, and, and the, the, governance, the, the governance groups. Um, and the final point was that ethics is entrenched in 37,000, which for me is a very important point to pull out, particularly for a principle-based um, uh, model. So, so I think we have, we have the, 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 the footprint before us. We just need to encourage others to be as, as passionate and as enthusiastic as we are as to why this thing should take root and flourish in the Caribbean. Thank you, Amkam. Yeah, thank you, Rani. Ronal? Um, just very quickly, conscious of time, but, but yes, again, thank you to Carolyn um, for yet another really um, comprehensive presentation and, and you know, the, the way you deliver, it makes sense for the rest of us who are trying to catch up with your, your living and breathing of, of covenants. Um, so yes, thank you for that, Ronnie. Thank you for, for our discussion as well. Um, you know, I think it it's continues to be so vital that we have these conversations that we continue to learn from each other. I appreciate being part of, of this session this morning. Um, and it, it allows us then to, to all go back to our, our day jobs and to our groups and continue to drive those discussions in some meaningful way, hoping that if we effect change within our organizations, collectively those organizations are then able to hold each other and hold our governments and our public sectors accountable. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is support our countries. We're all trying to make sure we do our part um, in driving the right types of behaviors and driving that central focus on values and purpose, because ultimately that has an impact on, on all of us, our children, our societies, our environment. And we have so many problems to address and we have so much to try to, to build on, try to correct and try to improve um, where our, our jurisdictions and our, our region as a whole are going. Um, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to continue to have that type of dialogue and, and hope that even if you didn't contribute verbally that, that we're all taking away something positive from this to, to do that um, within our own groups. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Chanel. Thank you. I think just a, a last word for myself is that um, governance is beautiful. Um, it is like that bird murmuration. Um, it is like watching a shoal of fish. Um, it is beautiful. and when it comes together. Uh, when it don't, doesn't come together, then you can see it. It's a struggle and it's an uphill battle. So maybe just a, a last message that says, just start now. And it's not about do, do, do. It's actually about being. Um, and it's, it's an attitude. It's a, it's, a, um, it's, a sense, it's a sense of direction. As a, it's not what you're doing. It's just it's being mindful and being purposeful in what you do. So I think if I can just leave um, the audience with that, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. I, I really, really found this was an amazing session. Thank you so much. You have led it beautifully. I just know that we are holding on to you from um, CCGIA, so you'd be hearing from us again next year, <laughs> and we would be inviting you to more sessions as well. So we could. And thank you session. to Ronnie and Ronell. I, I really admire the two of you. So thank you very much for being panelists. And thanks, Kamla, for inviting me. <laughs> You're most welcome. We are very, very happy to have had you. So thank you, Ronald, Ronnie, and Carolyn. Um, so this brings us to the end of this first session for today as we end day two of our second global conference. We will go on a short break now, after which we move into another part of the world. We will have a presentation from Saudi Arabia 
as Mary um, Picosiello um, shares with us some of the work that she is doing with the Red Sea development and how they are building communities out in the desert. Um, so, you know, very clear uh, impacts of climate change and how they've been able to um, focus on what are those sustainable issues to ensure that it's being managed in the right way. Our two panelists who will be joining um, uh, Mariam will be Claire Gomez Miller, the executive chairman of CLECO, and Brendan King, um, recently retired from Scotiabank and now also a director of CCGI. Our moderator for the next session will be Brenda Bowman. Brenda is uh, present here with us already, all raring to go. So uh, we uh, just take a 20 minute break now because it's at the moment it's uh, 12 or 6. Uh, we return at 12.30. Uh, just know that the, the room remains open, so you just need to mute your mics and uh, possibly take off your video if you need to. And we'll see you guys again um, for the next session right after. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome.